Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session. This is our fifth webinar in the series exploring interactions of COVID-19 and food security, food and nutrition security, hosted by the Food Security Program at the American University of Beirut. My name is Rachel Baum, and with my colleague Abid Yahya, we're going to act as the moderators for today's conversation, featuring a number of esteemed and highly respected guest speakers. The way this will flow today, we will provide introductions, then we'll allow each of our speakers to offer an introductory statement. They've all been asked to speak to the theme of sustainable food systems in light of COVID-19. Then we'll move to some moderated questions and we'll also open up to audience questions. So if you're following along through Zoom, you can use the Q&A option. If you're following along on YouTube, you can use the comment. Uh, let me please first begin with the introductions of our uh, different, our five speakers today. First, we have with us Professor Robert Parlberg. He's the Betty Freyhoff Johnson, class of 1944, Professor of Political Science at Wellesley College and Associate at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. He received his BA in government from Carleton College in Minnesota and his PhD in government from Harvard University. Dr. Chris Perry, our second speaker, currently works as an independent researcher he held previous positions at the World Bank, the International Water Management Institute. He is editor emeritus of the journal Agricultural Water Management. He's particularly interested in water accounting, the impact of irrigation technology on the demand for and consumption of water. Professor Tony Allen is professor emeritus of geography at SOAS and King's College London. With a base in environmental science, he's an internationally esteemed expert in water resources and the political economy of water policy and its reform. He was awarded the Stockholm World Water Prize for his work on virtual water in 2008. While now retired from teaching, he continues to be an active researcher and supervisor of research students in the framework of the SOAS King's College Water Research Group, which he formed and founded. Our fourth speaker, Professor Tom Hurdle, is Distinguished Professor of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University where his research focuses on the global impacts of trade, climate, and environmental policies. In 2013, he was awarded the inaugural Purdue University Research and Scholarship Distinction Award. And last but not least, we have Dr. Martin Koylitz, Assistant Professor at the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences at the American University of Beirut. He's the Director and Chair of the AUB Food Security Program. His research interests cover the global political economy of food and water and adapted food and water security strategies in water scarce economies. Thanks to all of you for being here and joining us today. At this point, we'd like to offer each of our speakers an, an opportunity to deliver an introductory statement, approximately four to five minutes on today's theme. What are your observations on the impact of COVID-19 on the sustainability of global food systems? What are the crucial intervention points in the months and years to come? We'll go in order and we'll start today with Professor Robert Parlberg. Professor Parlberg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rachel. And it's a pleasure to, to join this webinar. Uh, of course, COVID-19 is a, a, a colossal new challenge, but what I've noticed is it hasn't yet uh, stimulated a lot of new thinking about uh, reforming our world food system. Most commentators have used the crisis so far to, uh, to try to justify uh, recommendations they've been making for a long time to claim that this proves uh, I was right. And this goes across the political spectrum. Uh, the, the Economist, a, a, a pro-globalization, pro-markets uh, magazine, uh, produced a, an opinion essay which said that the crisis so far uh, proves that uh, our global food system can pass uh, a severe stress test. At the same time, Michael Pollan, who's a longstanding advocate for relocalizing our food systems, uh, published uh, an essay in the New York Review of Books at almost exactly the same time, saying that the crisis has revealed a sickness in our food system. It's made it more clear than ever before uh, the imperative to, to relocalize. Uh, Oh, I uh, I tend to side with the with the economist, but uh, you can you can cherry pick evidence uh, for for both of these uh, extremely divergent uh, 
arguments. Um, what, what I think the COVID crisis teaches us uh, so far about our food system is, is a vital lesson about how we produce and how we, we market animal products. Um, the COVID virus is a zoonotic disease. It came from animals in all likelihood from wild animals being sold at a wet market in Wuhan, China. Uh, wild in animals in and around our food supply have been uh, a growing problem uh, in recent decades. Uh, uh, HIV was a zoonotic disease that probably came from, from primates uh, in Africa. Um, then we've had Ebola, SARS, MERS, H5N1, H1N1, and now COVID-19. All of these are zoonotic diseases that have come to us uh, from originally from, from wild animals. The, it, the disease jumped into uh, our domestic uh, food animals or directly into the human population. So uh, COVID-19 is only the most recent, most dramatic warning that we need to do a better job of segregating wild animals from us and from our food system. And this means moving away from wet markets in Asia. It means moving away from, from the hunting of bushmeat in Africa. And it means raising more domesticated food animals in biosecure indoor confinement. Uh, most rich countries have already done this, but many poor countries have not. Now, uh, a conclusion of this kind is not gonna be popular with livestock traditionalists uh, and often for good reasons. They oppose confinement systems. Now, the United States has shown that confinement can be badly mismanaged. It can be accompanied by excessive and careless uh, use of antibiotics. It can, uh, it can put the animals in cages and crates too small to permit any freedom of movement, making these systems inhumane. But we also know that confinement systems can be managed well, as in Europe today, where uh, regulations enacted in the last two decades have um, sharply reduced the use of antibiotics uh, for, for weight gain purposes and have given the animals much more freedom uh, to move around. Uh, so uh, besides, going back to, to barnyards and pastures would not be an option today, given the much larger output of animal products that's demanded by the market. Now, uh, some uh, critics are, are actually depicting modern livestock confinement systems as a source of disease, but I don't think the evidence uh, supports this at all. Uh, MIT historian Kate Brown, writing in the New Yorker last month, warned us that barns packed with animals are good places to breed pathogens. Um, actually, uh, biosecure barns are one of the best ways to stop the spread of, of pathogens. This is why the Dutch government just two months ago ordered all poultry in the Netherlands indoors uh, following an outbreak of bird flu in, in Germany. Uh, moving pigs indoors is also good for disease uh, prevention. Uh, tapeworm parasites uh, were not eliminated from the meat supply in Europe or North America until traditional pig rearing was replaced by confinement production. And thanks to better infection control in modern indoor pig farming, the incidence of trichinosis is down sharply by more than 85% since uh, the 1940s in the United States. Uh, Dr. Rodney Baker, who is um, former president of the American Association of Swine Veterinarians, has said, uh, by bringing animals indoors and creating biosecurity, we've truly eliminated about 15 diseases and parasites that we had back in the 1980s. So uh, I think we should respond to the COVID-19 crisis, not by uh, refighting the standard battles about uh, globalization versus localization or, or markets uh, versus governments. We should instead be doing more to segregate our food system from wild animals to reduce risks of zoonotic disease. This means moving more domesticated animals indoors uh, and especially in the densely populated megacities of the developing world. And it means shifting away from wet markets and from bushmeat markets for meat. Uh, towards uh, supermarkets. If we don't move more quickly in this direction, the spread of, of human illness that we're experiencing today will return time after time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Carlberg. For our next introductory statement, we'll turn to Chris Perry. Dr. Perry, the floor is yours for the next four minutes. 
Uh, remember to unmute your mic, please. Okay, thank you. Um, well, realizing that I was in rather esteemed company for this afternoon's uh, presentation, I've been thinking a bit about what to say. And then I got round to writing it down this morning and it all looked quite controversial, but I'll put the ideas out there anyway and we, we'll see where it leads. I'm gonna talk about water, which is what I hope I know something about. And as regards water, um, Governments, if to the extent that COVID has any impact on how water is managed around the world, governments are going to have to do the things that they're mostly not doing very well now, which suggests to me that COVID is not going to have much of an impact. I mean, if we, if we review where we are now on, on governments and water, we all know that across the world, water consumption in irrigated agriculture is unsustainable, aquifers are falling, wetlands are drying, rivers are polluted, fish are dying. And the under underlying cause of that situation is, a, is an unfortunate coalition of the tragedy of the commons, uncontrolled access to a common resource, and Jevons' paradox, which predicts that the more productive uh, water becomes to a user, the greater is the demand for that input. So we have uncontrolled access and ever rising demand. And then we add to this the near universal unwillingness of government to intervene and essentially take away water from farmers and the future for water looks, looks pretty bleak with or without COVID. And this is unfolding locally um, and how it unfolds, how this uncontrolled demand and excessive use, how it unfolds is quite important. If governments intervene and manage their water for the nations that they represent, the process can be progressive, it can be managed and predictable so that farmers can accommodate and plan for reduced availability of water. And essentially farmers become researchers and they'll minimize the impact on production of reduced access to water. If the process is unmanaged, and remember that the law of conservation of mass requires eventually that the renewable supply and consumption must equate. There isn't an infinite supply of water in aquifers or anywhere else. Eventually, these two things have to equate. And if that process of equation is, is, is unmanaged, then the reduction in water availability to farmers will be chaotic. Nobody knows where, it'll, where it will hit next. And the reaction of that to, by farmers is the productivity of water will fall because farmers plan for more productive use, more inputs when water supply is reliable than when it is unreliable. So the decline in production, if water um, availability is chaotically reduced, will be more than proportional than the, fall, than the fall in water available to them. Locally, this all matters a great deal. It's in the collective interest of farmers to preserve the buffer that is provided by groundwater in particular, but it's not in their individual interest. Whichever way the process unfolds, there will be a fall in production from irrigated agriculture and a rise in the prices of agricultural commodities. And here, probably what I'm going to say is controversial. Many, many consumers will hardly notice the difference. One estimate is that the consumption of water in irrigated agriculture must fall by about 20%. This in turn might induce a 10% increase in in commodity prices before some new equilibrium is reached. Now the commodity cost of the food we buy in the shelves is about 10% of the food. About 10% of the shelf price that is. So now we're down to have a 10% increase, a 10% fall, sorry, we're now down to a 1% increase in the cost of food, which in turn is only a small product proportion of the cost of living to the average city dweller. Not to all of us, of course, but the political pressures will not be that great. So the winners in this process will be rain-fed farmers and the farmers in areas where governments have intervened to ensure that access to water is controlled. The losers will be irrigated farmers in areas where chaotic, chaotic disallocation of water is driven by nature. Consumers, to the extent necessary, will experience some minor adjustments to their cost of living. But all of these processes seem to me will unfold with or without the impact of COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Perry. 
for our next introductory statement, we turn to Professor Tony Allen. Thank you very much for uh, the chance to contribute to this debate, which is <clears throat> as interdisciplinary as, a, as I expected, and that uh, I expected um, Robert to talk about international politics, but he talked about uh, he, he's talked uh, about livestock. Um, so I would like to, um, Martin, will you move the slides? Martin? Yeah, yeah. So um, this cartoon I've used, it was my, uh, Mark Mulligan, the head of the department in KCL who circulated it first. Uh, this sums up uh, his approach or his expectation and, and mine. Um, in that uh, the left-hand bubble or bubbles are COVID and the big ones further down the road in the future are the, the big ones which we should be uh, addressing. So um, unfortunately, um, it isn't going to be the case that we do the logical thing and address the climate change and other environmental and social um, <coughs> economic issues. Next, please. So the food system, as I'm going to try to talk about, um, it looks as if it's the dysfunctional and, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah. It looks as if the dysfunctional and unsustainable food system um, in its clumsy way will get us back quickly to the business as usual food system, which we've been keeping in place for decades uh, and even centuries to some extent. Uh, we know that that was the case in the 74-79 oil um, economic uh, crisis, um, uh, as well as more recently in the 2008-2011 crisis, uh, when um, it, it took two, two years or so to get back to normal. In this case, we haven't had a, uh, a new, uh, the economist predicting a, a new normal of unstable prices and, and um, difficult circumstances. So um, what we I've discovered is that this hoary old um, food system, the political economy uh, of it, um, has, it has, has got itself in place and it's such an adaptable sy system, or let's say the way it's evolved is that it has lots of places where uh, politicians can deliver what they think society needs and society certainly is rather pleased about but that is the availability of the production and the uh, access to uh, underpriced food for the underpaid so that's what the food system aims to do and it does it it does it very unsustainably environmentally socially and in equity terms but it does it uh, and there's a a big price being paid by the planet and by society. Um, so I think that COVID should give us a chance to um, get on with dealing with the big issue of um, making the food system have um, not only the availability of affordable food, but all the other things which the food system should do, which is deal uh, not <coughs> damaged by diversity, not uh, create all the emissions and do all those things which are, are, are difficult. And I, I just make the point that in my looking at who seems to be coming from where to do something about this is a, a group of people talking about a just transition approach, which requires lots of goodwill to be coordinated and organized. Or the second is a reform of capitalism involving the internalization of environmental and social costs in, in the price of food. Um, I'm very interested in the price of food. Um, in the UK, we have records going back to 1264. And you can see that society, um, mainly rural at that stage, was um, used to it, the increase in the price of wheat um, until the end of the 20th century. Well, uh, sorry, until the beginning of the agricultural revolution. So the leveling off part was, uh, after 1750 or so was the agricultural revolution and then the steep decline from um, uh, <clears throat> 1850 or, or so is the industrial revolution um, <coughs> which has in which we are benefiting from the um, industrialization and 
various other efficiencies. But in doing that, we've created, next please, uh, uh, an assumption that there's going to be, or an, uh, an awareness and the evidence is there that there is a 1% decline in the price of food. There are the, um, <coughs> the big spike in the middle there is the 74, 79 event, the um, 2008, 12 event, which we are all, all, all have experiences there. And of course, there will be no, no blip in the 2020 event. So, but that, that decline in price is something which means that certain costs are not being taken into account. And it's a dangerous assumption. It can only exist if we've got the buffer, if we've got the environment to take the strain and part of society to take the strain. Um, and on food trade, which uh, mainly involves rich economies, but uh, is desperately important in terms of keeping um, <coughs> economies um, in place. You can see that the left hand um, group of um, the histogram there with every five years shown indicates that the US and Canada are leveling off. Uh, thank goodness South America is racing away as far as the uh, security of food is concerned and the transformation in the Eastern European circumstances. So there was five or six or seven economies out of the 210 in the world. The rest of the economies are net food uh, importers. Um, and that is the international uh, system that we have in place. It's a hoary old um, system which is adaptable, has adapted without any trouble at all to this particular crisis. And it, but it's not in fact, uh, dealing with the big issue, which is the, uh, the climate change and the other environmental and political and economic problems which are part of our future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Allen. For our next introductory statement, we'll turn to Professor Tom Herger. Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, pleasure to be here with this distinguished panel. Um, I'm, I think about long run sustainability questions. So I'll try to cast this discussion uh, in terms of the long run with some reference to the current crisis. Next slide. Um, you'll note there are a, a list of collaborators there. You'll see their photos pop up along the way. One person who's been influencing my thinking a lot recently is Keith Fugley at USDA. He, thinks about the long run in terms of, of um, what are the drivers of agricultural output on a decadal basis. So you can see um, strong growth uh, since 1961, but the sources of those growth have been quite different. During the Green Revolution, it was bring in more land, more irrigated agriculture, more fertilizer. More recently, um, it's been total factor productivity that is the bit that we can't explain with all of these um, inputs that we're measuring, that we're observing. And next slide, please. Total factor productivity can be related to knowledge capital. So this is based on work with uh, Keith and my colleague, Yuris Baldos. We took a hundred years of data from the US and estimated the lag between the time public R&D money is spent and the time it evidences itself in productivity growth. And you can explain most of the productivity growth in the US over the 20th century in this way. And you can see it lasts for 50 years. So this really is, if we're thinking about what drives agriculture, it's total factor productivity. What drives that is knowledge capital that accumulates over time. We need to be thinking ahead, looking ahead to the future, thinking about sustainability. Next slide, please. So TFP, how that translates though into output growth around the world varies quite a bit. Uh, this is a very interesting piece of work done by Paul Heise and Keith Fugley at USDA. And um, in the US inputs, when you aggregate them all up have been pretty flat. Why? Because labor has been leaving agriculture. So more chemicals, more machinery, but labor has been leaving. And so the input index has been flat, output's been growing because of the TFP growth that knowledge capital translated to improved productivity. Northwest Europe is quite different. Northwest Europe, they've been pulling resources out of agriculture. Land um, 
and um, other, you know, other kinds of, of inputs, less fertilizer being used in many places, Northern Europe. Um, and so they've kept output growth flat and they've used this as an opportunity to withdraw resources from agriculture in favor of the environment. Next slide, please. So what we need is, a mo is another concept of total factor productivity and that um, captures these environmental benefits from agriculture. So this is a piece uh, we have under review currently led by an ecologist from Leipzig, Ralph Seppel, thinking about this link between agriculture and the environment, biodiversity and other ecosystem functions in particular. So on the left, you have the traditional approach. We saw Keith counting up all the inputs that we can observe in agriculture, looking at the output. But um, what we're advocating in this paper is a more general approach, thinking about mutualism between agriculture and the environment. Down in the left-hand panel, you see an evidence of that with natural pollinators, increased visitations, enhancing yields, that's one of the ways in which biodiversity feeds positively into agriculture production. Factoring that in, I think, is something we need to do as we look forward in the long run to a sustainable agriculture. Next slide, please. But um, it's not just um, <clears throat> knowledge that you need for agriculture. You need workers. And even in the US, there's a lot of manual labor involved in agriculture. In the current crisis, Germany's flying labor in from elsewhere to work in agriculture. We've seen it's not just agriculture, it's the whole food chain, infections in the meat processing plant, the human element taking people out of those plants, shutting them down, um, has disrupted the food, um, uh, the food chain significantly. Uh, next slide, please. So as uh, I want to think about this as a segue into long run role of workers in agriculture, something we've largely taken for granted. There are always more workers. In fact, we're trying to get workers out of agriculture. But in fact, workers in agriculture are subject to, um, to we're heat machines. Humans are heat machines. High temperatures, um, humid conditions, solar radiation, all can impinge on your ability to work outdoors in agriculture. Next slide, please. And this just shows collaboration I've been doing with some earth scientists. Um, there um, you have current climate and future climate, and this is labor capacity. And you can see massive reductions in labor capacity under three degrees C warning, warming, where we may well be later in the century, um, particularly in the most in the tropics, in some of the poorest countries in the world, very significant reductions. Next slide, please. So we put this into an economic model, looked at all these responses, the food price thing that came up before, and so on, and we find that a lot more workers would be required in agriculture because of the diminished labor capacity. So whereas we've been shedding workers from agriculture in the past, more workers will be required in the future. And that's a significant change. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. I just want to emphasize, uh, go back to that really nice slide that Tony showed looking back at currently the COVID crisis behind us is the climate crisis. Um, some of these themes will be echoed there, but. Um, uh, climate change can, is likely to have very significant effects on agriculture in the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hertel. For our final introductory statement, we turn to Martin Coilers. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for the highly informed and very useful comments. Um, I would like to share my observations and uh, ideas about uh, COVID-19 and its relation to the food system. Uh, I think, first of all, we can already see that COVID-19 has this great revealing capacity. You know, after all, it's a natural disaster and there's, you know, exponential growth uh, involved. So uh, what we can see is that in some areas, our world, our business is already unsustainable. You know, we could say uh, our healthcare systems in some places uh, in the world, but also low-cost aviation is facing trouble, or entire economies, such as the economy uh, we're in here in, in Lebanon, but also in other places, these economies are tremendously suffering. So COVID-19 reveals our existing weaknesses, but also strengths. And uh, it also accelerates trends that could be witnessed for years. I think this is very important to also understand that trends are just being accelerated at the moment. 
On a good note, I think the food system right now has been remarkably resilient. Food trade is up and running and delivering food to billions of people around the world, despite the ongoing crisis and lockdowns. Um, yet access to food and thus prices have been very dramatically affected. Here in Lebanon, we've seen just within the past two months, an increase of food by about 25 to 30%. Uh, not just because of COVID-19, but rather because of the ongoing economic crisis this country is facing. And mind you, in between March 2019 and March 2020, prices already went up by about 40%. So we've, we've seen or we're seeing an increase of prices by about 60%. And that is of course, very, very dramatic. Um, luckily, coronavirus hit the world during uh, spring, or not the world, but the Northern hemisphere when the first harvests are readily available on the market. So I think we've been extremely lucky that it didn't happen in uh, October, you know, during the very dying cold winter months, but rather during, um, uh, during the, the spring. And so far we can say that our food system has met the short-term challenge in a very impressive way. However, the longer the crisis continues, uh, and if governments and societies do not adhere to strict measures in the, in the next 20, uh, 12, 18, or even 24 months, the more challenges we will encounter. Uh, governments have learned their lessons after the food price crises in 2007 and 8 and 2010, 11, uh, to increase storage. But storage will not last forever. Trade must continue to be open and it must be fair. And this is something a lot of people are rightly concerned about. Um, our hospitality sector uh, is already very negatively affected. In China, after the lockdown, restaurants opened again, but people didn't come, customers didn't turn up. Instead, people are still staying at home and remain alert. Remaining alert means that many people continue to prefer home cooking over restaurant food for hygienic reasons. And of course, the unfolding recession across the world will make home cooking without, without alternative for the majority of consumers. But this home cooking trend was already in place in the last few years. Um, it only got accelerated. You know, food bloggers and chefs on social media are extremely popular. You know, look at their websites, they have millions of followers. I think someone like Jamie Oliver must have made a killing over the past three months because he's showing people how to cook uh, you know, easy food at home. So people uh, stay at home and they probably are going to continue to stay at home and cook at home. And we already see some results. Belgian farmers have called on consumers to eat more Belgian fries as demand no longer meets supply. Um, so this reveals that our food system heavily depends on overproduction and indeed waste to remain profitable. Um, also, the meat industry has seen dramatic impacts uh, of the pandemic. Low paid workers in uh, slaughterhouses and meat packing factories are amongst the most vulnerable to contract coronavirus. And more and more consumers, and Robert Parberg already uh, very eloquently uh, spelled this out, have realized that uh, SARS CoV 2 emerged uh, on a live meat market. You know, in this case, it came from a bad but there have been hogs and birds that were previously responsible for new viruses. Hence, the new virus once again confirms the need to rethink the food system in relation to our uh, relationship with meat. And this is now more acute than ever before, because we also know that our food system is using vast amounts of natural resources. And as Tony Allen previously uh, showed, it is actually unsustainable unless we come up with new ideas. In 2007, I believe, I had this great privilege to listen to uh, the former UK Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurd. He was Foreign Secretary during the fall of the Berlin Wall. And during his meeting, and I think it was in, the, in, in, in Westminster Palace, he was pressed by people uh, why there wasn't, uh, or there hadn't been UN reform in the 1990s. And he was, I found this very remarkable. He was very candid about it. He said, look, 
um, there was no real need. The world was not in ruins. So why should we have changed our international system back then? Um, right now, the world may not be in physical ruins um, now or after the pandemic, but uh, it will need a fresh start in many economic sectors. And it will be tested like never before since the end of the Second World War. And the food system is one sector which will surely see changes. But it, it will be a different food system. Meat will become, in my view, more high tech, with perhaps the plant-based uh, meat industry becoming more important. And also, possibly, we may see uh, cellular meat uh, coming onto the market over the next 10 years. Um, interestingly, this industry touts itself as producing clean meat. And uh, this is, of course, a very, uh, yeah, it's a great slogan, uh, given the pandemic, and it may have a lot of truth in it. Uh, supply chains will also become shorter with more fruits and vegetables grown locally on high-tech farms. Finally, consumers will demand strict hygiene, so this will be another price factor. Maybe some of you remember the film Demolition Man, when uh, Sandra Bullock, um, you know, in which Sandra Bullock is starring. And, you know, they depict a world in 2030 where, you know, all restaurants are Taco Bell and they're um, extremely clean and people, uh, you know, uh, no longer eat in their neighborhoods, but they have to go uh, to travel far away in order to go to a restaurant. Um, I think, you know, we will see not perhaps, you know, similar changes, but we will see changes towards it. I, uh, food safety component of the food system will become a lot more important. Mm. The food system has long been given a role uh, as a source of livelihoods for billions of people around the world. This has led to ever more production, retail and catering, and COVID-19 may become a major game changer, changer this food system needed. This means governments and societies will need to rethink the food system, but what should it deliver? What pressures can it sustain? And I will leave this for now, and I look forward to the questions later. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much to all of our panelists for your introductory statements. We now have a round of moderated questions. In that time, any of our listeners, whether they're on Zoom or on, can submit their questions through the chat function or the comment function. So for our first question, I'll turn to my colleague, Abed Yehya. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, everyone, for your important uh, introductory statements. Our first question is to Dr. Tom Hertel. In your recent work, you have addressed food waste across income spectrums. What role does reducing food waste have to play to achieve a sustainable food system? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, indeed, we had a paper. That your microphone. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, in, we had a paper just came out in Food Policy led by a, a doctoral student of mine, Emiliano Lopez. And um, um, the central theme in that paper is that um, <clears throat> food waste is evolving rapidly. Most of the studies that have been done look at the food waste today and say, wow, we're wasting a lot of food. Can we reduce that? None of them projected this forward into the future. Right now, we think of China. I just have a figure from that paper in, in front of me here. Um, in 2013, we estimate that China accounted for um, uh, about um, a third uh, to even uh, a larger share of global food waste, which was uh, um, almost 500 kilocap kilocalories per capita per day. Um, in 2050, that share actually becomes smaller. And what gets larger is the, is the share of food waste in the emerging economies below that. I mean, if, you go to, if you've been to China, you've been around the big round table where they spin it around and you're full and they're bringing out more food and more food and you think, how can you you know, <laughs> waste so much food. But, but um, it, we project that this, uh, if you look at this over the income spectrum, it's those countries that are just beginning to grow rapidly, uh, say in South Asia, Southeast Asia and whatnot, that will be wasting more food in the future. So we project almost a doubling of food waste between 2013 and, and mid-century. So he, indeed a huge factor 
and um, one we need to pay more attention to. Um, it's also very hard to control. It's a natural thing when you're, um, the opportunity cost of your time becomes high. You can't go to the market every day. You're both working, both, both adults in the household are working. Um, <clears throat> it takes a lot of effort and time and your time becomes more valuable. So food waste is naturally evolving and, and the idea, um, well, the things we've tried so far have not been very uh, effective. There are natural economic forces driving this food waste and um, pricing of food <laughs> is one of the things that would influence this, but um, there, um, it's a challenge. I don't know whether you want to pull her on that. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Hurdle. We might revisit that in another, in another uh, comment. Thank you very okay. much. <laughs> Our next question is for Professor Robert Parlberg. Professor Parlberg, what would you say is the role of biotechnology, if any, in delivering sustainable future food systems? And has this role been affected at all by COVID-19? Oh, thank you. Uh, I'll talk about modern biotechnology, which would include uh, transgenic crops or transgenic animals, so-called GMOs. It would also include uh, crops or animals developed using gene editing techniques like CRISPR, a much more recent technique. Uh, these techniques could be playing a significant uh, role in improving food crops uh, around the world, but uh, so far they have not been allowed to do that because of government regulations. Government regulations have uh, prevented the use of transgenic techniques uh, in any commercially uh, available varieties of the basic staple food crops like wheat, rice, or potato. Uh, wheat, rice, and potato are not being grown in GMO form commercially, legally, anywhere in the world. Uh, it's astonishing. We do grow a lot of GMO corn and soybeans, primarily for animal feed. We grow a lot of uh, GMO cotton as an industrial crop, but the basic food staple crops that are most important to poor farmers uh, around the world are not being grown in GMO form anywhere. It's because of a regulatory system that was mostly exported from Europe uh, to the rest of the developing world that requires um, not just labeling, but tracing through the marketplace, uh, segregation, um, strict liability, uh, and also case-by-case -case approval of every new uh, event put on the market. Um, now, uh, we originally thought that gene-edited crops, CRISPR crops, were not gonna be regulated like GMOs because they don't contain any foreign DNA. But uh, two years ago in 2018, the European court made a surprise decision that uh, in the European Union, the CRISPR crops would have to be treated and regulated like uh, GMOs. Uh, I see a risk now that other countries around the world will follow the European example and impose the same stifling regulations on gene edited crops that they previously imposed on GMO crops. And this biotechnology technique for food crops uh, will also be uh, uh, killed in the cradle. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Parberg. Our next question is to Dr. Chris Perry. There's a tendency to regard the small farmer as the most capable steward of the food system. How does the small farmer need to adapt both in light of a longer term sustainability challenge and now in response to COVID-19? Well, I, I would, would tend to question the premise there. I, I would have thought it's the larger farmers who are much more uh, under pressure to follow regulations and rules such as might come out of the COVID crisis and other health, uh, health issues rather than the small farmer. I mean, if we, if by the small farmer, we mean essentially the subsistence farmer in a developing country, then pretty much they're focused on trying to make a living and maybe COVID comes a little bit uh, down their agenda. I, uh, to me, the small, the, the small farmer argument is always quite interesting. I mean, if you, if you project 10 or 20 years forward in any relatively poor country and you figure out what farm size is required to make anything like 
the average income or the 75th percentile uh, bottom lower end of the income, they're not going to be doing it on farms of half a hectare or one hectare or two hectares. The farm sizes have to go up as they have done everywhere else in the world uh, to much larger sizes. And in that context, I'm very interested. I mean, I'm interested in Tom Hurtle's response. I mean, he makes a very interesting comment that, that labor on farms may need to increase. Well, how does that play out as farm sizes increase and the, the degree of mechanization on farms in parallel also tends to increase, which seems to me to reduce the, um, the demand for labor. I mean, for sure in the UK at the moment, we've got big problems on food, uh, fruit picking and vegetable harvesting with migrant labor not being able to come into the country. At that level, the, uh, the comment is a different sort of uh, environment from the small farmers. Small farmers, as ever, their route to prosperity is out of farming, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Thank you. The question is from Martin Koilitz. Martin, global food systems are relying on an increasingly small number of corporate producers. What are the nodes of power in this corporate food system? And how are these nodes affected by COVID-19? Yes, thank you very much. Can anyone, can everyone see this uh, picture I've just tried to share? Is this visible? Yes, we can see you. Lovely. This is, I think, a very useful, um, well, infographic on the Dutch food supply chain. And um, there we can see on the left-hand side, but everyone, you know, we've already been talking about a number of things. You know, we have uh, Robert Pavlov mentioned the issue, you know, of farmers, Chris Perry just uh, now as well. Uh, so we have 65,000 farmers. We have one tenth of, uh, of the farmers is uh, food manufacturers. Then we have uh, about 1,500 suppliers. And then we have a handful of purchasing companies and managers. And they, these guys are extremely important. They hold the power in the food system when it comes to uh, making it more sustainable by introducing, for example, uh, proper environmental accounting rules. Uh, and then we have the supermarkets and obviously then we can see the, uh, the farmers and, you know, shoppers and, you know, and consumers and so on. And everyone has to play their role in order to make this food system sustainable, which makes it so challenging. Um, we absolutely need to understand that on the left hand side, when we talk about farmers and horticulturalists, um, the power is also with the big seed companies that provide them with inputs and so on. Um, and uh, of course, there's also power on the right hand side with the consumer side, they can really, you know, demand change. And, you know, as we can see right now, um, in, in the United States, in uh, Europe, uh, the dairy industry and also the meat industry is facing a number of challenges. Consumers are moving away from uh, our uh, traditional diets and they go more vegan or vegetarian. So what we actually need to come up with is a new business plan, a new social contract in order to understand how we can manage this food system more sustainably and therefore how to understand uh, to make use of the current bottlenecks in terms of power relations in the in the food system and we need to make those guys who hold the power the purchasing companies uh more accountable uh in terms of what they're doing and we need to highlight their role and we need to highlight their way or their contribution towards steering the food system towards a more sustainable level thank you very much thank you martin uh professor tony allen i would also like to know how do you foresee the role of farmers in a sustainable food system? Um, well, <clears throat> farmers are the managers of the environments. They manage 92% of the water. That means both the green and the blue water. Um, they um, uh, impact by diversity, say 66% uh, of the impacts comes from our farmers. Um, and the emissions, depending on who you're trying to have the conversation with, are at least 10% and some would say 35%. So farmers are the managers of our environments. Um, they exist in the food system at the beginning um, in what I call mode one, and they're responsible for the availability of food. Um, and that means that both uh, the governments are especially interested in that. 
in mode two, which uh, Martin has been substantially talking about um, just now, um, uh, the, um, we've got the food traders and food manufacturers and the supermarkets, and he's drawing attention to the perceived power of the, those particular organizations. Um, the difference between mode one and mode two is that, or many things, one is that mode one accounts for just 10% or so approximately the value added. Mode two accounts for 90% of the value added. Um, so we have a, a market operating, not, uh, quite effective, not super effective, but effective market operating in mode two. But in mode one, we have, I sometimes refer to it as a failed market, but certainly it's a market that can only be kept in place um, with very large um, public uh, funding. And so the political economy of mode one and mode two are very different. Farmers are absolutely um, um, essential. Um, we need that they have a livelihood which enables them to invest as well as produce. Um, uh, unfortunately, you saw my argument or my evidence that food prices are going down. It's not the normal perception that there is around the world, but the, the fact is that international food prices are going down. Um, and then, and I, I later on perhaps refer to that again. And um, uh, as a consequence, um, there's no way that a farmer can have um, a livelihood without very large public payments. And of course, COVID has indicated that the agricultural system, the food system, um, uh, just needs tiny amounts of money compared with other industries if things start to go wrong. Uh, in that, you know, we're talking 16 billion, 30 billion, whereas in other industries, it's trillions. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, farmers are absolutely essential. Uh, we should have them on the panel. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Professor Al. Our next question is for Dr. Perry. Dr. Perry, you, I think, touched on this in your introductory statement a bit, talking about the need for intervention, whether that would be managed or unmanaged, more or less chaotic. But if we were to think about the role that water policy could play in driving food systems towards more sustainability in the future, could you elaborate on that, please? And again, would that potentially have any effect, um, any shift as a result of COVID-19? Yeah, well, I, I could pick up on what, what, what Tony just said. And one of the slides that, that Tom Hurtle showed, where, where he showed this dramatic increase in, in total fact, factor productivity over time. And that's driven by farmers who are terrific researchers. I mean, I never met a farmer who, who didn't teach me five or 10 things if I talked to him for an hour. They're just amazingly, they're running amazingly complicated businesses in facing all sorts of uncertainty and so on. In the water sector, because we have governments are not making that input certain and limited and sustainable in the environmental sense, the farmers don't need to research as much as they might need to along that dimension. And in the areas where the water is constrained in Israel and Nebraska at the moment, and so on, farmers start doing really smart things to increase total factor productivity, noting that water is scarce. So in that sense, the government's acting properly will first of all ensure sustainable water use, it will secondly, change in some modest ways which which food is is more available which is cheaper more or um, expensive and so on but that'll just play out as the farmers figure out what's the best thing to do with their with the limited resource and again covid uh, all sorts of insights we've heard this afternoon about uh, what covid might do to my perspective i don't see that that uh, it plays out very largely for the farmer trying to make a living with constrained resources thank you Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Our next question to Tom, Dr. Tom Hertel. What options do water scarce countries have to ensure their food security in the, uh, the post-COVID-19 system that might be significantly reoriented to short supply chains? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, the interesting thing about water and water scarcity is it's a highly localized problem. So on average, there's plenty of water in the US. The problem is we don't have it where we need it. Um, and uh, say in the Central Valley of California, there's plenty. I look out here, it's been raining every day. <laughs> um, so um, it's a matter of the distribution of that water. So there are kind of, there are two responses to that. One, um, <clears throat> I've worked now over the last few years with, a lot with hydrologists, hydrological engineers, and they're, response is often, well, let's move the water. So there are big projects, interbasin transfers around the world. China is the master at this, move it from the south to the north, um, massive projects. Um, and when we've looked forward in time with an economic framework projected forward to mid-century, where are the shortages likely to emerge? How would you address those? The interbasin transfers turn out to be really expensive and not very effective and often you had a problem here, now you do the interbasin transfers, now you have a problem over here. Um, so we found that's not a very good response. But as a trade economist, my thinking is, why don't you trade the commodities, okay? So um, you, um, and I just wanted to show you um, a, a nice pinwheel here, if I can share my screen briefly. Um, uh, this is from one of those publications with uh, hydrologists, um, just showing how the pattern of trade is likely to change um, in the face of future water scarcity. So the point of this paper, actually we wrote the paper and the, the, the reviewers and editor came back and said, no, I think the point is about this paper is that trade can mitigate a lot of the, the food price effects of water scarcity. So international trade, facilitating international trade, um, un, uh, is, is key in this process. Um, and um, I think that, that's, uh, that's the way forward. Unfortunately, we're moving in the opposite direction right now to a great degree, certainly in the US, um, maybe elsewhere, um, moving away from um, um, free and fluid trade more towards barriers. And that's a real problem when it comes to accommodating this kind of resource scarcity. I'll stop there. Thank you. Our next question is for Professor Allen. Professor Allen, you've previously argued that the big food exporting economies have policies that self-harm economically or environmentally. What does this mean? Can you briefly explain that? And do you expect these policies to shift post-COVID? Uh, thank you very much for the chance to answer that question. Um, Robert and Tom, um, you're from um, North America and the points I'm going to make uh, highlight something or some things which I regard as uh, not very rational and hard to explain. Um, the, the trade um, volumes, uh, the diagram I showed with the big battalions on the left hand side doing a lot of exporting um, and the other um, 160 economies or more um, being net, net food importers. Now, for the past, all of my lifetime, there's been no doubt about it, that if you um, are going to import food, you're going to come out ahead because you don't have to use your own water or your own land or your own, um, in, uh, uh, <laughs> and manage to, uh, to um, produce or to have the food available. Now, if all of the costs of um, the water and the damage to environmental capital um, and, and, uh, and so on have been captured in the price, that would perhaps make a bit of sense because the North American exporters and the exporting governments could in fact um, to somehow get back uh, something to do some remedial um, things to the environment. Uh, but you don't, you've kept on exporting and exporting. So uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that if you're an Egyptian or a, a, a Londoner, you know, the sensible thing is to take all of these um, resources which are coming free uh, because you know, it's just such a good economic output. It's not a good global output. So could I just ask, why is it that the US and especially during Mr. Trump and um, <clears throat> um, uh, the present um, Secretary for Agriculture 
are urging more exporting, more production, uh, damaging the American environment, which we lead to have there as a buffer to help with the global future. Why, I, why have you got this self-harming global welfare system in place? Is it an unintended or an intended consequence of policy? Uh, why, why, why are you continuing to do it when it's so damaging to your environment, which we all need in future as well? Thank you. Who wants to pick up on that question? I'm not sure if it was intended to be rhetorical. Uh, oh, I, would, I, I could pick up on the question since it's, it relates to the question you're about to ask me. Yes, I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask? Uh, yes, please do. How, how do you see the role of the United States in the global food system yes. <laughs> in a post-COVID system that may be marked by shorter supply chains, changes, and the emphasis on uh, maybe it's on shorter supply chains or on national production? Will the U.S. maintain its export-oriented food trade approach, or it will be more skeptical about trade? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I can. I can join that with, uh, with Tony's question. And I would start by observing that the, the food trade posture of the United States has changed significantly in the last uh, several decades. In, in the 1990s, the United States imported about 11% of its domestic food consumption. Today, the United States imports 20% of its domestic food consumption. The United States is a very big importer, not just, not just a big exporter. It's an importer of, uh, of fresh fruit. We import more than 50% of our consumption of fresh fruit, much of it from tropical countries, which makes sense, I think. Uh, we import almost a third of our fresh vegetables. Um, uh, in the winter months, uh, you can grow vegetables in, in Mexico or Honduras or Peru that you can't grow. Uh, in the United States. We import 80% of our seafood consumption. So the United States is actually a big food importing country. And uh, I, I think that uh, is, I think that makes a great deal of, of sense. It makes enormous uh, sense for some of the uh, environmental reasons that Tony um, alluded to. But the United States is also still a big exporter. And I think it's a big exporter, especially of, of things like uh, like soybeans and corn because of rapid growth in demand for animal products in uh, East uh, Asia in particular, including China. Uh, the United States exports 60% uh, of its soybean crop, much of that uh, into Asia, 14% of its corn crop, much of that into Asia. This is a growth in demand for, for livestock products. It's driven by that, not by, not by government uh, policy. The, uh, the government policies we've seen recently, and here I think uh, I, I would agree with Tony, they're, they're very hard to understand. This, the disruptor hasn't been the COVID crisis. It was the election of Donald Trump in November, 2016. Uh, Donald Trump has abandoned the traditional Republican position on agricultural trade and agricultural exports. He, uh, he ripped up trade agreements that uh, Republicans had championed earlier. He started trade wars uh, with our best foreign customers, including um, uh, China. Uh, he's now driven out of office, the head of the World Trade Organization. This is, this is a, major, a major destructive effort on his part. Of course, what he wants to do is destroy something, renegotiate it, claim it was a better deal and a win for the United States. But if you look at the new China deal, it's uh, pretty much status quo ante. If you look at the new NAFTA deal, it's pretty much status quo ante. So the way to get rid of this disruption is, is to vote Donald Trump out of office in November. And it's my hope that that will happen. The damage he's done so far hasn't been permanent. I don't think it will have to be permanent as long as he's replaced by a more traditional politician in November. Thank you very much. And our final question in this moderated round is for Martin Coilers. Martin, how do you see the role of the US dollar in the current food system? Could that change over time, whether due to existing trends or as a result of COVID-19? 
Well, I'd say the dollar is perhaps one of the, the hidden uh, challenges at the moment. Um, you know, uh, Robert Parberg mentioned The Economist earlier on. I'm you know, a big fan of the Financial Times at the moment. And the Financial Times had a, a wonderful article this weekend, uh, not just wonderful, but very worrying article, um, that basically we, we can see um, dollar shortages, liquidity shortages on the, in the global economy. And of course, this affects food security. This affects our global food system. And don't be surprised if countries that are already water scarce, that are net food importers, such as in the Middle East, but also in other uh, world regions, will try to produce more and further mine their groundwater resources for the short-term gain in order to not rely on the, you know, the US dollar. So what is happening is that the US dollar is used as a weapon um, at the moment, and it's uh, a very dangerous policy. And it also you know, contributes to ideas by, for example, Yanis Varoufakis, who wrote um, a very interesting piece last year in Open Democracy to argue, to call for, um, a new or different reserve currency for you know basic or essential items such as food. Um, right now, we can see very worrying friends, and you know I agree with Robert Palberg uh, that the United States is you know or this administration is trying to disrupt things, but they could easily make things a lot worse globally and also environmentally, and they will throw back than attempts to. Uh, make this food system more sustainable. And uh, we have to also then bear in mind that there is an alternative and we can you know, look back to the last crisis in 2008. Obama went for global cooperation. And you know, we could, one could argue that the financial crisis has, ne has never been fully resolved and so on. Yes, we saw a food crisis, um, but at the end of the day, we didn't see large scale destruction. Um, and we did see, you know, still the United States being the most powerful country in the world. However, right now, uh, this current administration is uh, pursuing very dangerous policies. And I agree with Robert, hopefully it will be stopped in November and then there will be more traditional politicians to take over and identify global cooperation measures. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. With that, we've come to the end of our moderated questions. And so we have an opportunity for those folks in the audience to pose a question should they wish. Those of us who are following on Zoom can use the Q&A function or anyone following along on YouTube, that can be done uh, via the comment box in YouTube. Uh, just very briefly, we have a, uh, Eli al Haj would like to ask a question. So please, uh, Abid, if you can give Ali al Hajj uh, speaking rights. Here we go. Ali? No, I'm not sure you know about Right. <clears throat> uh, yes, thank you, Martin. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Eli is, uh, he has written the most wonderful thesis uh, or the most wonderful topic ever. He wrote the thesis, uh, what was the title? Um, uh, Deserts don't bloom, uh, camels don't fly uh, on Saudi Arabia's water story. So uh, Eli, you're a very eminent thinker, please go ahead. Um, my uh, comment is on, um, the effect of uh, withdrawing um, government support to and subsidies to farmers uh, in case uh, farmers are able to uh, charge all the uh, cost elements in uh, uh, producing their uh, their uh, <clears throat> Uh, produce. Uh, in, in that case, the cost of production of farmers is going to be passed on to uh, phase two, to uh, the trading, trading companies and, uh, and uh, the producers of foodstuffs and to supermarkets, which will mean higher prices for the uh, consumer. 
this would mean uh, that the poor among, com compute, uh, uh, among consumers is going to be adversely affected, leading governments to support the, uh, uh, their, the poor uh, among the population. And at the end of the day, the uh, subsidy which the government is paying farmers is going to be shifted from the farmer to the consumer. So therefore, as far as the, the uh, national accounts are concerned, there is no difference between the government supporting the farmer or the government supporting the poor uh, uh, among consumers. Uh, so therefore, I would say that the system is not broken. Uh, uh, the, the food system is not, is not broken. It's just an issue of allocation rather than uh, 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 simply irresponsibly helping farmers by governments. Can Martin or Tony answer this uh, uh, observation? I hand this over to Tony. Tony, do you have a... <clears throat> Thank you, Ellie. We, I'm sorry we, we no longer meet every Friday in our locked-in position in London. Uh, thank you for raising the issue. Um, as you know, my perspective on this is that the hoary old um, um, food system um, is so uh, useful in that it delivers what politicians and poor people want. Uh, politicians want to deliver underpriced food uh, to the underpaid. Um, as we examine that, the outcome of that policy or the outcome of what the food system achieves, we are realizing, of course, that it's doing damage to the environment, <coughs> not helping lots of the labor within the system. There are other problems. <coughs> yes, it is a question of allocation. It is a question of um, public policy. But for the moment, um, we have a system of governance in the United States and Europe and other places where the, the people running the system in Parliament, um, have, they, they just background the problems and just know that if the system as it is goes on, and this is why it's likely to lock in place after COVID, um, is because the system does deliver uh, what society wants and what politicians need to be able to stay in power. So what we're asking them to do um, is um, a, a big challenge. And I haven't got the answer yet, but um, um, <coughs> we do need to mobilize uh, a different way of organizing food production um, so that um, America's um, wonderful resources are not degraded and uh, constantly worsened. And the countries, by the way, I take the point, uh, Robert, that you, uh, the United States is importing uh, food from elsewhere and you're suggesting that just uh, cancels things out. I would regard that as you know, doing two things badly. It's a, Two, two wrongs don't make a right. Um, if the water isn't being carefully managed in the country from which you're importing it, then that's not good. And it is, I, I, I can't understand why in the United States, <coughs> you, you just ignore the value of the things that you're uh, sending abroad. And um, you seem to be suggesting that it's, uh, uh, the, the outcome is a conscious Policy making rather than the um, accidental outcome. So, uh, thank you, Ellie. Uh, I think I've answered partly your question. Thank you, Tony. Professor Hertel, I think we would also like to hear from you on this question. Uh, yeah, just a quick um, <clears throat> illustration to underscore Tony's points uh, more vividly from the US perspective. So, if you think about the US agricultural system, the biggest burden on the environment is uh, posed by beef. Um, a recent pub publication, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences looked at 
land use, water use, biogeochemical uh, cycle, right down the line, beef is off the charts as a, as a, as a uh, commodity, the consumption of which has a big impact on the environment, to say, say nothing about health, but just on the environment. Um, what's happened for various reasons over the last decade is the price of beef has risen dramatically relative to pork and poultry. And as a result, uh, cons per capita consumption of beef has dropped by about 20%. So that's an illustration of, of Tony's point that if you price something, um, <clears throat> um, that, that's why you want uh, to take away the subsidy at the producer level and let the consumer price more re realistically reflect the cost of the resources embodied in that commodity. Consumers will respond, they'll shift from beef to poultry, it'll have some health benefits as well, but it'll really benefit the environment. So that's just a specific example of how this has played out uh, recently. Thank you. Um, I would also like to uh... At one point to this, um, it's not just about taxing or rising prices, also nudging consumers to perhaps more sustainable forms of, uh, of meat replacement. So, for example, we can see this dramatic shift amongst the young generation to veganism, vegetarianism and so on. And, um, you know, we might talk about Apple today as the most valuable company. Um, but wait for Impossible Burger or for uh, companies such as uh, Memphis Meats. Uh, which are working actively on uh, the idea of uh, of uh, cellular meat. Uh, impossible does uh, plant-based meat. So there are alternatives and we need to nudge consumers actually in the next decade to consume differently um, and therefore, you know, allow the environment to recover and not having to overproduce uh, what Tom just said. The beef and uh, its environmental footprint is, is so dramatic that we need to uh, to really see changes in the next uh, 10 years. And COVID-19 can help because we can see that this entire industry is in fact not sustainable environmentally, but also socially and uh, I'd say increasingly uh, economically unsustainable. Thank you. We received another question. And this one, I think there's several folks here who may like to, to comment, uh, Martin, Tony, Chris Perry, but it's open to anyone. Asking more to know about the role of local farmers and water user associations in improving the management and use of water towards sustainability. For instance, we haven't heard much on the use of water user associations and how yeah. the individual farmer to the group uh, group perspective of farmers. Chris, maybe you'd like to go there? Yeah, sure. Well, th there was a huge um, emphasis on participatory management and water users association and so on in the, eight, in, the well, in the 90s, particularly. And the, in retrospect, it, the outcome was not that great. Um, in my opinion, the reason for that was that a water user association is great if they know how much water has been allocated to the association so that they can manage it. So even though the water, the water user association is a sort of a bottom-up um, construct, it can't operate in a vacuum because unless they know how much water they've been allocated, they just act like any other individual farmer and take as much as they can get and so on. So, one of the reasons that, um, that water users associations as a mass sort of promotion of the World Bank and other institutions in the end didn't get very far, in my opinion, was again goes back to the government wasn't setting the, the top level allocations down to lower, progressively lower levels. So you got to the water users association. I mean, if, if you look at um, the Careses and the Aflage and so on of the, of the Middle East, which survived perfectly well for ages, they were effectively water user associations but with a defined source of water which they could all get around and debate and negotiate as to who who should get priority uh, for the allocation of that water that was great they knew what their allocation was they operated within it but a water users association as an abstract construct without an, an assigned water right um, doesn't get too far on the sustainability issue anyway would anyone else like to comment on this issue 
you know, from Professor Alan Martin. Do you have anything to add there on the water user associations? No, I don't. I think uh, Tony Allen, would you like to add something? No, I, uh, Chris, I was right in, in there at the time and he's summarized it extremely well. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Are there any further questions? I think what we'd like to do at this point is we may move towards wrap up and thank all of our speakers. If there is anyone in the audience who has a question that we've managed to miss, or if there's anyone who has a question afterwards, you can find us on Twitter. You can send that our way, AUVFSP. Um, but right now we'd like to thank very much all of those who joined us today, share their expertise, their views, their perspectives, and their guidance. Um, we will be, the recording of this will be uh, accessible later for folks who've either missed or want to go back and watch, gather any of your uh, guidance and references to papers, for example. Uh, we will have our next and final seminar of the series next Thursday, examining uh, COVID-19 food systems and policy responses across countries in the MENA and Arab world. And so we enjoy, uh, we invite everyone to join us again back here. You can join us either via Zoom or YouTube. Thanks to everyone, and we wish you all well and looking for a brighter future post COVID. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.